One of the emperor's first cares was to endeavor to put an end to his dispute with the pontifical court. On January 19, 1813, he escorted the empress to Grosbois, where Prince de Wagram gave a grand hunt in their majesty's honor. But instead of returning to Paris, Napoleon went to pass the night at Fontainebleau, where he was not expected. The empress joined him there on the morrow. Several Italian and French cardinals, archbishops, and bishops assembled around the Pope in this residence, were busy in negotiating the arrangements which should put an end to the disputes which had taken place for several years between the Holy See and Tuileries Court. Napoleon, growing impatient at the slowness of these negotiations and relying on the influence which he knew himself to possess over Pius VII, wished to take advantage of this to deal directly with the Holy Father without any intermediary. In consequence, the emperor had several private conferences with his holiness, the result of which was that a new concordat was signed in the empress's apartments in the presence of their counselors and of the court. The Empress Marie Louise had taken a great part in bringing this reconciliation about. She had been to call upon the sovereign pontiff at the time of his arrival at Fontainebleau. She returned there of her own accord after the signing of this concordat to offer the Holy Father her congratulations. The Pope, who was a very apostle, Full of sweetness and charity, loved Napoleon in spite of all, and Napoleon on his side had for him esteem and even affection. It is almost certain that they would have come to an understanding if the Pope's Roman counselors had not unceasingly held up before his eyes to check him the menace of the anathema with which he would be struck in case he were to abandon the rights of the church or sacrifice the smallest fragment thereof. The Fontainebleau Concordat was destined to dry up at their very fountainhead all these religious quarrels. It provided for the solution of all the most important questions. First, the establishment of the Pope at Avignon which was to become the see of Christendom. Secondly, the fixing of a delay of six months in which the briefs of canonical investiture were to be delivered to the bishops by the Metropolitan in case there had not received during the period stated the bull of investiture from the pontifical court. The Concordat of 1801 had passed this matter over in silence, and the pontifical court, had taken advantage of these circumstances on more than one occasion to leave churches in France, Italy, and Germany unprovided with priests. No sooner had the Pope been left alone than he once more fell under the influence of his former counselors, who had been recalled from exile by Napoleon, and who were in the pay of his enemies, the enemies of France, and initiated in their secret designs. They worked upon the conscience of the gentle and venerable pontiff to bring him to refuse the concessions which he had freely made in a spirit of concord and pacification. The Pope, obedient to their suggestions, addressed the emperor two months after the signing of the new concordat, a letter in which he explained his scruples and the reason which induced him not to carry the conditions of this covenant into effect. The emperor's only answer was a decree in which he commanded the archbishops, bishops, and chapters to see that these conditions were rigorously carried out. Affairs in Germany, and especially the precarious state of our alliance with Austria, demanded Napoleon's serious attention. Austria professed the friendliest feelings and was not a cherry of protestations, but the always equivocal conduct of the Vienna cabinet kept alive the emperor's distrust, which was certainly thoroughly justified. Every report he received from Vienna informed him that in political circles, the disillusion of the Confederation of the Rhine and of the Grand Duchy of Warsaw was being talked of. These pretensions, it is true, were attributed to the Allied forces, but the language in which these rumors were hawked about revealed a desire to see these things realized. Two enlightened doubts, which were still existent in his mind, Napoleon thought it better to replace Monsieur Otto, our ambassador in Vienna, by Count de Nervon, his aide de camp, whose old standing relations with the Viennese aristocracy during the exile might render him better able to sound the private intentions of the Vienna cabinet.
The new ambassador was not long in obtaining the revelation of the intention of this cabinet to propose an armed mediation, thanks to which it should become the arbitrator of peace. The new role with which Austria was trying to assume changed our situation, for it was evident that France was about to lose the best guarantee she possessed against Austria's bad faith. In declaring herself mediator, the contingent supplied to our army by this power would no longer be forthcoming, and from that time forward, the alliance would rest on the most fragile foundations imaginable and on assurances of friendship of which the Vienna cabinet was never cherry, but whose sincerity Napoleon had reasons to mistrust. Whilst awaiting the turn which these events were about to take, Napoleon devoted himself to the details of home government without neglecting the achievement of works which had already been begun, he reduced the sums of money allotted to each. He paid visits to the public establishments and showed himself in the Faubourgs, where his simple and homely manners aroused the enthusiasm of the people. These walks in Paris were constantly inspiring the emperor with ideas for improvements, embellishments, and useful reforms. He notably gave orders for municipal works for the distribution of water in the various quarters of the town and the increase in the number of fountains for the achievement or construction of market houses, slaughterhouses, sewers, bridges, for the erection of large buildings intended to receive the archives of the empire, the university, and its dependencies, a school of fine arts with studios and exhibition rooms, and finally for the establishment of four large cemeteries at the four cardinal points of Paris. This useful employment of the few moments which the constant anxiety of war left free to Napoleon is an example of the advantages of every kind which the departments would have derived from the journeys which he proposed to make as soon as lasting peace should give him the leisure to do so. Napoleon also went with the Empress too, the Invalide reviewed the old soldiers there, inquired as to their wants, tasted the food provided for them, and made the empress do the same. The sovereigns walked through the gallery in which were exhibited the raised plants of the fortified towns and harbors. The emperor remarked, amongst others, the plan of the harbor of Brest, which had been just finished and which he praised highly beginning of the year 1813, the emperor had opened the session of the legislative body in his person with a speech in which he had spoken of his losses, of his hopes, and of his desire for peace with the greatest frankness. This speech had been followed by a speech by the minister of the interior in which he read out a statement of the situation of the empire during the two preceding years. Napoleon had also busied himself in constituting the Regency, the exercise of which he had decided to confide to the Empress. It had been proposed to him to give a special household to this princess, at the head of which a surintendant should be placed. However much the Emperor objected to the creation of any fresh charges at court, this proposal had seemed to find favor in his eyes. He had then cast his glance on Monsieur de Narbonne, whose distinguished intelligence and courteous manners had always pleased him as a fit man to fill this post. But he soon abandoned this project and took this officer as his aide-de-camp until the time when he sent him to Vienna. Monsieur de Narbonne justified the favor shown him by Napoleon and served him with constant fidelity until his death, which occurred at Torgau where he had been appointed governor of the town in 1813. The liking attributed to Napoleon for the representatives of the ancient nobility was part of his system of fusion and proceeded from the resolution that he had taken to render himself at one with all that was distinguished in France. This consideration outweighed what attraction he may have felt for those polished manners, those delicate flatteries, that fine and often ornate wit, those traditions of good taste and of urbanity, which especially formerly distinguished the pick 
of the nobility at court. The ensemble of these reasons had prompted Napoleon from the moment of his accession to power to make advances to the representatives of these families, making use of Monsieur de Talleyrand in this work of amalgamation and reconciliation, which he had undertaken. It was thus that he had placed the Dukes of Choiseul, Praslin, and de Lunas in the Senate at the time of its formation. Various persons had been proposed to fill the post of secretary to the commands of the Empress region. Amongst others, Monsieur Ferran, a former counselor to the Parliament of Paris, the same gentleman who became Louis XVIII's minister under the First Restoration and who intrepidly assumed the responsibility of laws best calculated to exasperate public opinion. Then, Monsieur Duchesne de Gilvoisin, another parliamentarian. These selections not having been approved of, the post of secretary to the commands of the Empress Regent remained vacant. When the emperor decided to constitute the empress's regency, I was seriously ill, for I had returned exhausted with the fatigues of the retreat from Moscow. Napoleon, whom I was consequently unable to attend, ordered Duroc, the grand marshal of the palace, to write to me that the need I had of repose and his wish not to remove me from his person had prompted him to register me as in convalescence, to use his expression, near the empress's person, and that, in consequence, he had appointed me secretary of the commands of this princess. Some days later, he conferred the title and powers of regent on the empress by letters patent, and she took the oath in this capacity in a cabinet council, which was convened for the purpose at the Elysee. King Joseph was acknowledged lieutenant general of the emperor and the prince archchancellor, first counselor to the regency and charged with giving his visa to all documents emanating therefrom. A minister of state, the Duke de Cador, was appointed secretary to the regency and filled the post of secretary of state during Count de Roux's absence, when the latter accompanied the emperor beyond our frontiers. At the same time, Marshal Duke de Conigliano was designed to fill the functions of Colonel General of the Guard and General Caffarelli. The Emperor's aide-de-camp was charged with the command of the detachments of the said Guard, which remained in Paris. In my new capacity as secretary to the command of the Empress, I received through the agency of Count de Roux, Minister, Secretary of State, the Emperor's instructions with a copy of the letter's patent which bestowed the title of regent on the Empress Marie Louise, a copy of the Senatus Consultum constituting the regency and of the Senatus Consultum fixing the Empress's jointure. This is Count de Roux's letter. Monsieur le Baron, the Emperor having appointed you secretary of the commands to the Empress regent, has commanded me to communicate to you the documents of interest to his majesty, which it is necessary for you for this reason to be acquainted with. In consequence, I have the honor to send you here with copies of the organic Senatus Consultum on the Regency and of the Senatus Consultum, which fixes the Empress's jointure. It is right that you should hold these documents at the Empress's disposal and that you be able to lay them before his majesty whenever she desires to see them. The Emperor also wishes you to prepare the protocol of the Empress's cabinet and that you should present it to the Minister of Exterior Relations who will submit it to Her Majesty. The original of this protocol will remain in your hands. It is also necessary that you should withdraw all letters and communications which may have been addressed to the Empress from the Ministry of Exterior Relations, and that in future you should write the answers to such communications. It is essential, Monsieur Le Baron, that you should procure everything concerning the statutes of the imperial family and the constitutional acts of the state to place them at the disposal of Her Majesty the Empress whenever she may need to see them. Such, Monsieur Le Baron, are the Emperor's desires which... His Majesty has charged me to acquaint you with. I have the honor to offer you the assurance of my high esteem. Signed, Daru. 
When I was appointed secretary of the command of the regent, and as this appointment was only a temporary one, I did not draw the salary attached to this post. The emperor provided the funds for this salary with an allotment of four thousand francs a month and furnished a very fine house at St. Cloud for my use, requesting me to live there with my family whenever the empress should be in residence in the palace there. At the same time, he gave my wife and myself our daily entrees to the empress's evening drawing rooms. And lastly, he ordered me to write to him every day, which I never failed to do and without a single interruption. I took possession of my functions in the empress's service some days before she was declared regent. I had had frequent opportunities of appreciating the gentleness and the kindness of this princess. My frequent relations with her taught me to know these winning qualities still better. She took pains to render the exercise of my functions as easy and as pleasant as possible so that they were a real sinecure. The order established in the dispatch of affairs was so well arranged that the intervention of the regent was hardly noticed. She was in reserve for extraordinary circumstances, which fortunately did not occur. The death of the emperor, for example. My chief employment was my correspondence with the emperor when she was away and my work at the Council of State where I was on ordinary duty. After having provided for all matters which claimed his foresight, matters which we have just enumerated in part, Napoleon at once prepared himself to join his army. Almost on the eve of his departure, Prince Schwarzenberg announced long previously a bearer of good news. At last arrived in Paris. The emperor contented himself with putting him into communication with the Duke de Bassano. Murray. So anxious was he to find himself on the scene of the military operations. The Russians had crossed the Elbe and were occupying Dresden, which the king of Saxony had left in going to Prague. Prussia had concluded a treaty of alliance with Russia at Kalich. On February 27th, the emperor left St. Cloud for Mayence on April 15th at four o'clock in the morning. In the morning of the same day, I received the following note from the Empress. You are sure to know that the Empress has gone. I like to think that you are a good deal grieved at this. I beg you, if Mr. Faint has not yet left, to tell him that I want him very much to give me news of the Emperor. I did not find t time to tell him so myself. I beg you also to send me the list of entrees, the emperor wishing them to be sent to me in the course of the day. I beg you to believe in the assurance of the sentiments with which I am your much attached. Louise, St. Cloud, April 15th, 1813. The first essay in her new role, which the empress made, was a reception of the diplomatic corps, which took place on the following Sunday. She sustained the character of empress regent with nobility and affableness. The first success of the campaign in 1813 gained six days after the emperor's arrival in the army. A success which was violently contested was the Battle of Lutzen, which opened the gates of Dresden to the French army. The king of Saxony made haste immediately afterwards to return to his capital.